Hey, Wednesday. This is Business Pants. You know, there's nothing more satisfying than head cold? like than your well, head cold's not it. But then uh, the familiar sounds of a podcast that sound start the same way when you say "Hey, hey, hey," and I giggle like a like a little like a school child. It's Why amazing. does it make you giggle? I don't know. I just think it's amazing. I just love the energy of it. Jeez. You're so understated in real life when you go "Hey, hey, hey." It just makes me feel good. I'm understated because I'm I'm in the world of ESG and I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should hear me about other things. So I, it is ESG Wednesday, so it's a good thing that yeah. we don't know what we're talking about here. At <laughs> well, this you know, I think you know, I think you know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's the great ruse. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking uh, of ESG Wednesday. Yeah, you wanted to get at it. Yeah. All right. It's uh, what's what is it? It's January twenty second, and I am having mouse problems today. We go inside the pants, which is uh, ridiculously appropriate given the World Economic Forum. But uh, today we're going to look at a bunch of headlines in our industry. We're going to talk once again about this new stakeholders rule revolution. Uh, I have a few games for Matt to play. Ooh, I like games. I didn't know this was coming. Yeah, some... Well, yeah, some mild games, some uh, some un- some non-entertaining games, and then finally Matt's gonna make something. <laughs> Nothing says entertaining podcast like some non-entertaining. Yeah, it's games. like it's like I always hated the game Clue, so it's like it's like Clue. <laughs> oh, so we guess something that no one cares about. Yeah, exactly. And we it was the like, wrench in the suppository we, or we the repository. We meander pointlessly around a board. <laughs> All right, let's get at it. All right. Uh... Okay, some headlines from our from our from our industry, which we're calling what? The I guess our pants, because we're going inside it. Inside the pants. So this is stories looking at the looking at environmental, social, and governance aspects of corporations. The first story this week: incoming BP, BP CEO Bernard Looney. Oh, tough name. Right. I had to pause on Looney. Uh, he reportedly plans to expand the company's climate targets and is considering overhauling the structure of the oil and gas company in one of the biggest shakeups in its 111-year history. Looney plans to adopt broader carbon emissions reduction goals that will likely include emissions from fuels and products sold to customers rather than just the far lower emissions from BP's own operation. So, I mean, I think it's like these kind of things are like, totally necessary and required of humanity at this point if we all don't want to be australia on fire but yeah. sounds like you're parroting uh the business roundtable and larry fink yeah but there's a big but here isn't there because what's the but the but is in order for us not all to be australia on fire bp in some ways cannot be bp right like it has to be a totally different company like, yeah. we can't burn the stuff that we burn anymore in order for it to happen. So it is very strange. It all feels like while we like to herald, you know, a big target, it also feels like unless your target is BP no longer extracts petroleum and oil and gas from the ground to burn later on, unless that is the ultimate goal, aren't we all just kind of like inching ever towards permanent fires fire yeah well as I, as I said without a shred of eloquence yesterday I think this is the decade of holding bullshit targets to the fire <laughs> please don't pun on my show don't. Uh, a new a new Oxfam report highlights the startling scale of global inequality the world's 22 richest men have more combined wealth than all 325 million women in Africa. Why do we lump everybody in Africa together? Well, in this case, we're lumping the women of Africa together. (laughs) Women and girls across the globe contribute an estimated $11 trillion to the global economy with a total of 12.5 billion hours a day of unpaid care work, a figure more than three times the worth of the global tech industry. Here's another stat for you. 
Mm-hmm. There are more men named John, Michael, James, Thomas, William, and uh, there was another name than all women on Damien? U.S. Uh, not Damien. Than all women on U.S. boards combined. And I'm pretty sure they make more than all the women combined also. So we don't have to go to Africa to find income inequality or equ- inequality of any kind. We can just find look right the at any random company and any random Intel released a massive diversity report, which was amazing and groundbreaking in as much as they released it that said we're totally unequal about pay and who we hire. So do we have to really so, like so start adding up how many women are in Africa that don't have money and say, you know, a bunch of billionaires have more than them? I don't think so. Take your complaint to Oxfam, Matt. Uh, <laughs> the CEO of Avalon, one of the world's top leasing companies, said that airlines with the best environmental scores should pay less for leasing aircraft than more polluting competitors. So there's a there's an ESG solution right there, Matt. What about airlines who crash airplanes because they didn't do due diligence? Do they pay slightly oh. more then? How does that work? Uh, food giant Nestle. <laughs> I'm just going to provide the snark for the entirety of today's show. Will invest more than $2 billion to source more recycled plastics for packaging its products and reduce its use of new plastics by a third by 2025. It has vowed to make 100% of its packaging recyclable or reusable by 2025, blah, 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 blah. Does this stuff mean anything anymore, these these uh, announcements? I think that kind of has. I mean, a lot of those plastic issues are front running what is inevitable regulation because because i mean we we talked about this when we were back at the mothership we wrote it in a in a paper back then um and i think we did a podcast on it even esg now podcast on it at msci um the the when china stopped taking recyclables from basically the u.s but the entire world because Mm -hmm. everyone was just dumping anything that was like waste recycling on China to deal with, uh, when they sort of stopped, it meant we have no place to recycle stuff. And that means you cannot make as much waste. And I think every corporation has scrambled effectively to keep up with the fact that regulators globally are, don't know what to do with this stuff and they're going to regulate it. They, they're, if they're not already, they're going to, I think Starbucks had an announcement too, that they were going to stop all single use plastic. I think I saw that on some feed yesterday or the day before i think it is this is this is not a new trend but it is um uh cute that now we're all thinking about it because all it took was china being like stop giving us your shit we don't want it anymore um i'll tell you what i'll I'll tell you what the 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 head of sustainability at coke had to say um so coke is uh responsible for the it's the most polluting brand uh, of pol- plastic waste okay who said that it said uh according to uh the charity break free from plastic so coke but coke is saying they will not ditch single-use plastic bottles i like this honesty here because consumers still want them <laughs> right i just read a paper or a, or an op-ed in forbes this morning that talked about how stakeholder capitalism is a sham it's all about consumer capitalism and it made like compelling points, but that is why consumer capitalism doesn't work because people will buy what is cheap and available, not what necessarily is sustainable. Oh, that's, I guess that's changing. Would you say that's changing? Like for your daughter, how old's your daughter? She's, she's, she's in her teens, right? She's an 13. Instagram generation. 13. Does she care about this stuff? Uh, not yet. I, I think that like they're the morality of this is a little bit more ingrained for her generation. Like they're I think they're starting off as better people, maybe because they're stupid parents like me. They they we drum it in more. So I think their baseline is already higher than it was a generation ago. Um so that they don't they wouldn't they're automatically predisposed you know, to, to not have a, a, a single use plastic bottle, right? They already just, they, they intrinsically feel like it's stupid. So they tote around these metal bottles and such, hmm. but does she care? 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think my daughter is the right test case on this. <laughs> I mean, she had to live in she had to live in France for a year, so she's a totally different beast. Well, I'm gonna bring on my oldest, an interviewer, because she is like a. I, this had nothing to do with me. She's turning into like she's trying to start a cleanup crew at her elementary mm-hmm. school. She's eight. She wants to like get her friends to go out in the woods and pick up trash and See, then weigh yeah, it. Yeah, I like it. She wants to weigh the trash to show the kids in the school this is how much trash you're throwing in the in the woods around our school. Stop it. So yeah, good on her. That's a totally different generation. I like it. Way ahead of my daughter. Sorry, daughter. Uh, Brazilian state prosecutors on Tuesday charged Fabio Schwartzman, which sounds like a villain from Die Hard, the, uh, who was the former CEO of mining giant Vale. I already forgot. You told me how Vale, to yeah, Vale. Uh, charged him and 15 other people with homicide, homicide for a damn disaster last year that killed more than 250 people. That's right. He's been charged with murder. Wow. Um, in addition to those charges... Uh, Vale and TUV, the German company responsible for inspecting the dam, were charged with environmental crimes. This is something, right? Especially in Brazil, where they're literally saying that, you know, the there isn't climate change. I guess you can't get away with um, you can get away with saying there's not climate change because there's not a populist movement around that. But if you let everyone off the hook from Vale for a mine that collapsed due to climate change and the company not paying attention to it. But uh, the environmental disaster that ensued, if you let them all off the hook, then you have a populist uprising, right? Created a monster business roundtable. They're charging CEOs (laughs) with murder. I think that was their goal. A staggering gender pay gap of 27% at Citigroup. That's, yep, in 2020, 27% has prompted the company to readjust the salaries of some of its female employees. That's one way to do it, right? <laughs> Pay them more? I mean, come on. I mean, really, I, I, this stuff is still weird to me. 27% in 2020? Just adjust that shit. Look, I have, a, I have a good friend. She is a powerful executive at a big company. And mm-hmm. she has not taken, you know, she goes and gives talks and she does not ask for speaker fees. And uh, found out later that, like, the men were getting speaker fees. That's, That's crazy. I, I think people just don't – they don't even know. They don't even know to ask. Like, and that that I actually be- yeah. speaks yeah. to the importance of being forced Ethics. to disclose the 27% pay gap so that yeah. every woman at Citigroup is calling up their boss being like, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. What are you doing? Hey, name and shame, it works. It works. All right, the last headline, uh, Subaru set a target to sell only electric vehicles worldwide by uh, the 2030s. The 2030s? I know, it seems like a long way away, doesn't it? (laughs) But hey, but, but, you know, maybe this is why BP CEO Looney is starting to get a little nervous. Uh, Yeah, well, I mean, there's already a company that does that. It's called Tesla. Yeah, but still, you know. Only electric vehicles in the decades. That's it's something, something. That's, All right, that's it. That's it for my let's broad headlines. Let's sell. Let's celebrate. Let's go to the. <laughs> Look, I, you know, I'm only I'm only saying that story because I live in Maine, where everybody owns a friggin' Subaru. So I had to. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. You're excited for Subaru. I'm excited for my electric Subaru. I mean, it, it gets crappy gas mileage, and I I want an electric Subaru. Get a different car. I I, I can't quit it. <laughs> you and BP. Yeah, I know. Um, all right, let's uh, let's get back into the real the real meat of our inside the pants. So this is we're part we're we're now like this is the third week of 2020, and it's obviously the 2020 is the stakeholder year. Right? Can I say that we were way ahead of this? We, I mean, we we had the stakeholders rule category for the duration of our company and our show, and prior uh, we've been talking. I mean, come on. We've been talking about this well before Fink and Business Roundtable and CEOs of MSCI. Yeah, let me tell you about the IP that MSCI is sitting on, speaking of. Yeah. Because I I created the metrics for stakeholders internally in like 2010. So, I I mean, we just waited. Everyone's just waiting for someone else to say it before. Now it's like the only thing anyone ever thinks about. But let's talk about this. 
And if anyone's listening from these ESG uh, research data providers, which you should be. We have two listeners. Okay? I think one in Finland and one in the Philippines. I mean, it's only a half hour, four times a week. You can listen to what we're saying. But get get on this. Start creating some stakeholder data. Come on, start. New, you got to create I'm some new data for points. Them. I'm just going to do it for them. I got that, next this. next week. I'm going to unveil the the we did employee as stakeholder the the how you value a company based on the employee stakeholder. I got customers coming up next week. I got investors. I got governments, and I've got a system value. It's actually all done. We're going to be on our website. You can get it all here. It's free. You don't have to wait for some data provider. All I'm, I'll give you the methodology. All you got to do right. is subscribe. That's it. Yeah. And tell your mom. All right. I'm going to, I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to talk, tell you some stakeholder rules, stakeholders rule headlines. This is what's going on in our world right now, which is kind of hard to believe, but, but this is what's going on. Uh, stakeholder capitalism or the idea that companies have a greater purpose besides just providing returns for shareholders has hit a tipping point, according to Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff. Tipping point. I'll keep going. <laughs> if you're thinking you can produce a profit if you're a shareholder and not address your owners and not address your employees, you're going to have a problem, according to Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan. Here's Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. The the corporation's purpose is to find profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet. Uh, a survey shows that most people think capitalism does more harm than good, right? A survey? Uh, and, was, that, was that with like... That's from Edelman's Trust Barometer. They also said that most workers expect their CEOs to speak up on issues such as income inequality. Uh, according to, again, here's Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, all, inv all investors are saying, I want you to invest in companies doing right by society. Uh, more than 80% of Australian business executives believe climate change will damage their companies. That's a big doy there. And finally, global index and fund provider MSCI said that investors need to more readily integrate ESG factors into investing philosophies, blah, blah, blah. We are sounding the alarm bells that if you are an investment institution and you're not embracing this and taking it into account, it's going to be at your own peril, said CEO Henry Fernandez. This is a different tone from MSCI. Yeah, let's do MSCI second because I want to ask you a question first about the this conversation. Uh -huh. And it's really simple. Do you yeah. believe a word of it? Is this genuine? <laughs> okay, here's. I, I mean, I, I, you know, oh God. You just I mean, you're asking like, the... like old guy in a balcony from Muppets. I just feel like you're. A, I feel like uh, you're asking the. I feel like you're asking the wrong guy. I mean, here's my honestly. No, think go it full is. socialist on me. I'm I'm cool with that. I'll I'll tempt, okay. I'll I'll meter you out. Here's what I honestly think it is. I I think that this is this was born in the days after Trump won the election at the end of what was it the end of 2016 and yeah. as, as his presidency began and he started to reveal some of the the more shameful secrets of being a white male ceo in america and and these are not these are some very unsavory things like like just a ridiculous amounts of greed uh sexism racism just all the ugly stuff Right. I think that these CEOs got together and we're like, we have got to do something. We have to get out in front of this like this. This could create a, a populist backlash from the left. And one of the, the one of our key jobs here at the Business Roundtable is to stay in power. So this is what I really think. I think that they they they, they were worried that the populist tones and would shift you know, and that wouldn't all be Brexit, wouldn't all be Trump, and that we could tip back to the left. And I think they wanted to get ahead of this. And I think that the best way to get ahead of this is to say, tell people to shut up that we're doing something about it. Like we're dad, daddy's home, and he's gonna, <laughs> and he's gonna take care of it. And I really, I really think, that, and I don't even mean this like in a weird, cynical way. I, I, if if anything, I, I think this is a a very normal thing that they should be doing. I mean. I understand that people in power want to preserve their power, whether I agree or not. Yeah, that, that's I, I, it. To me. I get it. I get it. I mean, what? I, What's it to you? That, so, so I don't know if it's a 
a reaction to like a fear of a po- left populist uprising. I think it's manifesting that way for like Leon Cooperman. Um, uh, That's part of it though. Who's That's currently crying it. his okay billionaire tears somewhere. But, yeah. but I, but I do think um, it is a fear of a revolution and not like a revolution, like, like what you're going to, you know, like Pitchforks in some fire. black quarters of the internet, like the way they talk about like rising militia revolutions or whatever in all corners of the earth. I mean, a change of the status quo. And I think you are right that they're getting ahead of anything that forces them to change the status quo by adopting the language of yeah, the revolution right. before modifying the descent. I, I think, I do think that's a real thing because here, here, here's my problem with all stakeholder conversation. And we've talked about this and we'll keep talking about it. Revalue your company based on what you give to stakeholders and then we'll see. It's not different to me than when Citigroup says there's a 27% pay gap between men and women at our company. They only do that because they're largely forced to or yeah. they're, they're put in a corner where they have to give you that information. If a company, if as an investor, I was able to look at a company and say, this is the value you create for stakeholders writ large. And guess what? It sucks. Like mm-hmm. then you're talking about a real change. Then you're talking about because the the well, early the yeah. early numbers will suggest that some of the, the some of the speakers might actually be the worst the the worst messengers for stakeholder capitalism. But you know what else you know what else City Group is doing, and, and I think this is part of a, a bigger gameplay by the business roundtable is is and the, I think this is this is very important, and, and I think what they're doing is they're self regulating, right? So they're yes. they're staying they're staying just enough ahead of it, which is to say that we don't want what we don't want this is in the power in the hands of the people or the government yes. to to prescribe these things for us because then we might be screwed. Yes. So they're saying, oh, we're we know, look at us, we're we're and I and I and I I use this word on purpose. Uh, we are man enough to pay our women more. Aren't we great? Like right? Like that's. <laughs> But I'm serious. Like, so we're self-regulating. So leave us alone. We're we're the uh, we're the stewards of stakeholder capitalism. We'll take care of it. Well, so this is where the MSCI conversation sort of comes in a little bit to me. Okay. Because, and it's not just MSCI. It's any ESG provider. It's anybody who sort of spent a lot of time in the ESG community, right? Like, but they're arguably the they're arguably the biggest provider. So I think they're a fine example to use. They're fine. No, not, not to using... not to mention that they're what like eight nine percent owned by BlackRock. So there's a so this a that here. that to me is what makes this whole thing feel conspiracy theorists, um, because you end up in a situation where, and this may be totally coincidental, but it all doesn't feel that way. You. Like go from 2016 or even just prior, you have CEOs talking about um, beginning to talk about income inequality. Income inequality was the big conversation at Davos last year or two years ago. And Jamie Dimon was out saying it's like one of the biggest, you know, issues facing our the United States and the world income inequality. And the only reason why someone like Jamie Dimon would say, talk about income inequality is if you're worried that income inequality will effectively unentrench you from your position, your seat of power. Mm -hmm. And, and then you have this run up to the business round table talking about stakeholders. Then Larry Fink has got his, you know, his letter two years ago, his letter this year. And BlackRock is both the biggest client and the biggest shareholder of MSCI. Now, MSCI is out talking about stakeholders. Now, we know the MSCI ESG team. There's nothing. There's no connection between what, you know, the BlackRock, you know, conversation and what the CEO of MSCI is talking about necessarily. Well, okay. There's no literal connection. There's no literal it's in connection. The back. Like it's in the back of people's heads, but MSCI comes out with the, their trends for ESG and, and includes stakeholders. And I think that's the, that's a correct trend, but then right. it's like the rubber needs to meet the road somewhere. And it's not like buy our ESG product. It needs to be something else because it becomes off. It ends up coming off as self-interested, even if it's not intent, it's intentional. 
it looks that way to an outside observer. No one will take it seriously because Larry Fink has a lot to gain by you listening to him about stakeholders and ignoring the fact that no one knows how to measure what it is he's talking about. MSCI has a lot to gain by talking about stakeholders because they can just frame it as ESG ratings are what you're going to use as a, as to create your product around right, stakeholders, right. right? It's And it's not that it can't come from a provider like MSCI or Sustainalytics, but it needs to be a different solution. It needs to be something that everybody says, this is the value that's that this is how you value a company based on stakeholders. So what, what's the counter argument here? Well, how would, how would MSCI disagree with you? I mean, I'm not sure how they, I, I mean, I, I think, I, I think in some quarters they wouldn't, but I also think that they're, that they're, they're look, they're genuine people working on a genuine problem. I don't think it's like a big conspiracy theory, but it's just the optics tend to be kind of not great. They well, put out they a big like, principles like, paper right. yesterday, right? Um, MSCI's Principles of Sustainable Investing. And okay. in it, they effectively used every talking point that was in a sales deck for the last 10 years. Right, okay. And it's like, that's th they may be true, but the optics end up looking bad because it's you have a vested interest in someone believing ultimately you. they're ultimately they're selling something there's you have you're selling that right so, and so what are they what and know. what are they going to tell you like you know we're we're blackrock is look is blackrock for seven think, trillion dollars of asset under management so we're we're changing the world in a nerdy princeton-y way no like, right? i think like, in are the they end gonna say that? They, they need to be genuine about what it is which is we have something to sell you that's something may do a social good it may not but effectively like mm -hmm. there's big money in sustainability now there's right. a lot of money at stake well, that's that that probably should scare some people that's fine but but ultimately brian moynihan jamie diamond henry fernandez larry fink these people aren't talking about esg and sustainability unless it's in their business interest to talk about these things and right. that in and of itself, not being the message, being the underlying message, being like the narrative is about like capitalism is changing. We want to invest in companies that are doing well by society. That's not like the thing unless somebody's willing to buy that as a thing, like unless there's big money in it for you. Otherwise, time and time again, it's been proven that's not the case. If the big money was somewhere else. Don't we think they would go to where the big money was? And that's the problem with the optics. Yeah, no, I do. I think you're right. I think they're, I think they're, it's about the money, but I also think it's about staying ahead of the, the game. And this I'm is no disrespect to our ex-colleagues at, at MSCI ESG, who I think for none of this really touches them, right? Like, I love those people. I know those people really well. You do too. I don't think it's about, like, chasing the money for the people that we worked with well god no, no but at a corporate level at a firm level you think you're yeah. going to make a corporate strategic decision to favor stakeholders because what that would mean is could be totally different from chasing what people will buy that's why you need an objective measure of stakeholder value yeah, uh, globalized standards, right? I mean, we and have I'm to not, be. I don't. I don't want to get into standards debate, but it's got to be objective. Like, it's got to be something that people can will say, like, okay, we can. We all we do agree that is what stakeholder value, the number, equals, and now we can but, adjust accordingly ourselves. But can I say not only that? It has to be something that is like relevant to actual people. I mean, if you're going to start throwing around the word stakeholders, you're basically opening up your your insular investing world and you're trying to invite the rest of the world that has to deal with you. So start using terms that are meaningful to them too. Right. I mean, this is what, this is what I really want to see. I want to see like numbers and data points that normal people can understand. Like, like you said about yesterday with Microsoft, like they need to plant 19 million trees. I mean, that's a relatable number, isn't it? Well, that's why when I when I did like employees as stakeholders, that data, I basically just said, I mean, the output is how much money did you make over minimum wage? Mm -hmm. Like as an employee of that company, because right. at a bare minimum, you should expect minimum wage. And then everything above that is basically a return to you for your time. Like you spend 
5,600 years of time of, of lifetimes per year as employees at a place like Walmart. What do you get paid over minimum wage for your time? Like what is, uh, what is your payback? Uh, we're our, since we're already here talking about MSCI, uh, I'll change the order of the show a little bit. Do you want to talk about the 2020 ESG trends to watch? I, I only bring this up because I know you used to write this paper in the past. I know we've, we've looked at the 2020 trends. We talked about them. Anything jump out to you that you want to discuss or would you rather just move forward? I mean, we can, I, I, I don't, I mean, I mean, uh, I wrote the paper for <laughs> seven years. I, in fact, yeah. the 2019 trends paper, we won yeah. an award. Um, I we? saw me and you, <laughs> the day me and uh, you won, win an award. The, yeah. Uh, I'm going to retire that day. No, oh, we, that, we, <laughs> that, that doesn't, that didn't feel right. We, no, Linda Ealing Lee, um, and I wrote the paper largely and won an award for it. I'm still waiting for my trophy to arrive in the mail, but it won an award. That was last year's paper. Um, this year's Amazon paper, I read it. Probably. I, I know who, I know the, all the players who wrote it. Um, I thought it was interesting for the, for, you know, for the most part, but I did stop on the stakeholder one and think this is maybe the most important and obvious trend of 2020, given that well, yeah, how much Scott, we talk course, about it, has to be. Yeah, it has to be. and utterly w- was perplexed by the way like there's there's a chart in it that kind of like measures some sort of return to stakeholders that was perplexing to me. I just my takeaway was even the Illuminati at MSCI have not quite figured out how we measure this stakeholder thing. That's that was my my takeaway from that from that particular oh, oh, trend. Otherwise, or, go read the paper. Yeah. It's, it's, or and this is this is where this is the stuff that matters to me or how to just how to talk about it like human beings i mean i know like that's not what they're not paid to to relate to normal human beings but <laughs> how dare okay you? so let's let's say that let's say we are entering a stakeholder uh, generation right and and this and these are the stakeholders that that they list in that business roundtable everybody lists okay customers employees suppliers communities and shareholders so let's I don't care about shareholders. Forget about them. Okay. But the first four, no, I'm serious because the, all we've ever talked about is shareholders, right? So let's talk about the first four customers, employees, suppliers, communities. These are the people that we need to develop a language for so that, th- so that this is so that these numbers, these conversations are inclusive, right? I mean, but we're like so far away from that. I look at, I look at this, there's a, they have a chart called it's purpose, Measuring the purpose pledgers against their peers, the purpose pledgers meaning being the people, the corporate. It's, it's the BRT, the business roundtable. It's members. the BRT and some of the corporations represented at the World Economic Forum versus an index that MACI keeps, the world index of roughly like what, 1,500 companies. Um, and I'm looking at this and I see, I just see things like socially beneficial products 9.8% data privacy data privacy breaches 0.9% average 3 year annual employee training hours 33.1 anti corruption This is riveting podcasting by 80, the way 82.8% <laughs> but i'm just getting to a bigger point it's like I, i'm sorry but I, you know it, if we're going to start to include stakeholders in this we do we do need to develop data points uh, common languages, whatever that that we can include more voices in this conversation. Otherwise, it's just again we're back to the business roundtable preaching to everybody else to leave us alone. We'll take care of it. This is what this smells like to me. I I, I mean, there's something to that. I, I I do I don't mind Arcana because I'm a bit of a wonk anyway. Like I don't. It's fine. It's fine. Like, I'm, I, I'm no statistician, but I, I don't. I but I do think um, to your point, stakeholder is an open source concept investing is a closed source concept, right? Like we're not, we're not in the investing industry anymore. We were there for decades combined. We had access to all this data that like normies don't have, right? Like, I'm right. sorry if you are listening to this and you're like a human, you don't have the data that other investors, like professional investors have. Not only that, you can't Even get that's it. A problem. You cannot yeah. afford it. It is not accessible. You need to, you need 40 IT people just to get it into a format you might be able to make a decision, an actionable decision using. Or it would cost you so much money to have somebody else do it for you. You'll never, ever, ever do it. So you need to effectively be a millionaire to be an investor 
of any note, which, but stakeholders are not investors alone. Stakeholder is an open concept. It is an yeah, open yeah. source solution that's needed. And, and that is part of the struggle here. The, our, our messengers are the closed sources for well, yeah, an open right. source conversation. I and I think if the business roundtable actually believe what I'm saying, then the, then the next step would partly, I think, would to be would to make this data publicly available and 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 to put it to put these things into context in a way that people stakeholders can understand, right? So that they can compare a, a, a BP to a whatever to an Aramco to an Uber or whatever it is, right? I mean, you can't just as you said, you you can't just keep it all to yourself and keep it all shrouded and 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 so closed off. Stay tuned to stay Business tuned Pants more, because more ramblings. it will be on Business Pants. We are going to try to open source this. I yeah. will let you all know. And by you all, I mean both of our listeners, <laughs> Filipino and Finnish. Here's a, here's, a, here's a first idea that will scare you, Business Roundtable. Because um, we, we, we spent a lot of time here at Business Pants looking at your board composition, which we think basically is if you squint, it's one person named John who <laughs> – <laughs> who burns quickly on his vacation to the Bahamas. But how about this? How about this thought? How about adding members to the board? How about one each that represent the cons the customers, the employees, the suppliers, and the communities? How about that? Business roundtable could be a board chattering. with a union, uh, a, a supplier. Uh, they do it in Europe, at least with employee representation. So this is not so far fetched. Can you imagine like uh, Joe, the mechanic sitting on the business roundtable board being like, what the fuck are you all talking about? This is are you making fun of Shaq me. on Papa John's board? Not board? to not to disparage Joe, the mechanic, who is right. very good at his job. Let's move on to Matt Makes because yeah. we're okay. we're over. Actually, no, no, I don't care if we're over. You can you can edit this later. <laughs> Uh, let's, I want to play a quick. Uh, I just want to play a quick game with you first. All right, all right, all right. We'll play one game, okay? Um, because we basically talked over all the other games, so I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna edit. I had three games. I'm gonna edit two of them. I'm just gonna play. Let's just play the Trump game. It's still. Let's not forget. It's still. It's still impeachment week, and and Trump himself, I think, represents so much of what. Is going on with stakeholder capitalism and and the World Economic Forum and all that, right? So, I got a Trump game for you. It's, it's the Trump headline game. Ooh. Okay. Okay. And it's a it's a pretty simple game. Is he right or is he wrong? The Trump is Trump right or is Trump wrong? And these are these are all topics that we talk a lot about here in Business Pants. You ready? Okay. Um, Trump demands Apple unlock iPhones. They have the keys to so many criminals and criminal minds. What do you think? Is he right or wrong? <laughs> uh, Don't laugh. What What he's wrong about is they already know everything. Mm -hmm. What he's right about is they haven't unlocked it. I think it's. I, I think. I think it's the dumbest idea. <laughs> okay. So I you're mean, saying that Apple should not be unlocking their phones for the government. I mean, in criminal uh, cases. What at what point is it a hundred percent surveillance state? If because if Apple unlocks their phone, then everybody's needs to unlock everything, right? So and it, yeah, and this kind of this this starts to erode the the power of your Apples and Facebooks and and but and Tim Googles, Cook right if, if data if data becomes if it's not completely private, it sort of changes the whole landscape here, right? I mean, I don't know that right or wrong applies to things that Trump says. As, t as Tim Cook stood next to Trump while he said, thank you, Apple, for opening this amazing plant. Only Apple opened it in like 2013. That was like f a month ago, right? So yeah. is... uh, so you're saying Trump's wrong. You're saying Trump's wrong. <laughs> All right, next. Trump calls Boeing, which is clearly our favorite company the last three months here at Business Pants. Trump calls Boeing a very disappointing company. <laughs> Is he right or is he wrong? He's right. He's right about that one, right? <laughs> I, I I applaud Trump on that one. It is. It's. I would call Boeing a very disappointing company. That's, at this point. That seems yes. He's in right, his Trump. in his way. That's very understated. President Trump says Elon Musk is like Thomas Edison. He's one of our great geniuses. We have to protect our genius. What does that mean? And is he right? 
Um, uh, protect him from who? Yeah, that's a good question, right? He's the CEO of a publicly traded company. What does he mean protect him? Protect him from shorts? Protect him from... I don't know, right? Protect him from, from stakeholders? <laughs> but no, but, but this is something we've talked about a lot here, like this this founder fetish, this CEO fetish, this 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 uh, genius yeah, we fetish. Yeah, don't, we, don't we don't need that anymore. Should we? So, so we shouldn't be protecting Musk. Is that what you're saying? He's wrong. The idea of governance is you don't protect one person at the, at the expense of all else just because they happen to be a genius. Governance yeah, I don't is that, balance. I don't know that Trump is fully understands what public corporations are really all about. But. Or governance or governing. Yeah. So. Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's a great quote here he has about Musk, too, is that not only is he good at electric cars, he does good at rockets. He does good. That's what, that's what Trump said. He does, he does a good, good rocket. At rockets. <laughs> all right. The next <laughs> part of our Trump game, the next one. Uh Trump, this is what Trump said. It wouldn't be too frightening if Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg ran for president. Is he right or is he wrong? Dear, Notice he didn't say win. He didn't say win. He just said ran. But I think he means I think he means if he was president. So what do you think? Is he, he right or wrong? Is when, the president of two billion people's private data? Two billion and does, growing. Does he need to be more president? E? So you're saying it would be frightening if Facebook. I'm saying it's no, already right. frightening. Trump does not like China and Huawei, and this is the ultimate in American like um, uh, ignor uh, ignorance is maybe the wrong word, but willingness to overlook reality, which is we don't like. I mean, can we? Would he say the same thing about ByteDance, which is the parent company for TikTok? Their CEO. Oh, well. Yeah, we know that he wouldn't. Well, he, their CEO couldn't run for president. They're not not American born. Oh God, technicalities. Yeah, I got you on that one. <laughs> um, God, this is gotcha journalism. I got two things to say about this. One is that I wonder if Trump really is if he's kind of laying the groundwork here for a, a, a CEO of that stature to actually become president of the United States, and and beyond that to keep his CEO role at Facebook while being president. I, I, I actually, right, that's, like the, that's like the perfect the, the double win. Like that's the, the all time win, right? I, Stay CEO's Facebook and be president of the United States. Um, I, I actually wonder more significantly whether this has to do with secret dinners with DJT and Zuck and Peter Thiel. And well, yeah, this whole, Could be this whole, like, right. Like very bizarre, quiet interlocking, and and like the no the the lying political ads, they all feel related a little bit, sort of, kind of. It makes yeah. my voice well, get into falsetto, which must means yeah. it must be bad. <laughs> Considering Trump is now you know giving quotes on all of our favorite topics here at Business Pants, they're definitely interrelated. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna kill the Trump game there. Good that was job. a good Thank game. You. I like that game. Yeah, right. yeah. I'm going to insert some crowd gonna, noise at the I'm end gonna, of that. I'm going to give up my microphone and pass it to, to Matt. All right, I'm going to keep mean? it quick. So today I want to make, um, I want to give you three too soon victory lap numbers. I think it's too soon to do victory laps on a bunch of stuff. And on ESG Wednesday, we feel, I think the ESG community is feeling pretty good about 2020. Like we turned a corner. It's very mainstream. There's a lot of conversation about it. Yeah. It's popping up all over. Um, mm -hmm. But like Don Beebe knocking the ball out of Leon Let's hands. Ooh, I, I like this right? picture. Like Great a picture. 90s reference yeah. to yeah. football. Love it. Um, I, I think. I think it may be a little bit too soon to take a full victory lap. Okay. So here's right. here's victory lap number one that's happening. I'm going to give you three of these and we'll move quick. Number one, over $20 billion in new ESG fund assets in 2019, which is a four times increase, a 400% increase almost uh, year over year. There's a massive surge on ESG, however we're defining that, whatever the acronym happens to be, but ESG and ESG-related assets going right. into um you know funds uh, or fun, fund flows into funds so this is money that people are basically buying esg funds this is from morningstar shout out to john hale the, yeah. morningstar is doing really interesting kind of like esg work on the fun side it's fun to yeah. watch what he's doing but here here is victory lap too soon okay 
Yeah, put it in a context. I don't even know what that number means. It's Vanguard funny. alone brought mm-hmm. in net new assets of 183 billion in um 2019, okay? So Vanguard right. is one of the largest asset managers. So right. Vanguard just money that they brought in was I, I mean significantly it's a nine times more than all global ESG funds. And Vanguard in 2019 released mm-hmm. as part of their proxy voting. They voted yes on only 6% of environmental and social oh. related proxies. And nice. they voted with management for directors 91% of the time. Huh. So we can celebrate that ESG assets are growing, mm-hmm. but a little too soon to say ESG is totally mainstream when the biggest asset manager in the world it, one, or one of them next to BlackRock is not exactly. Yeah. So agreed. Caring, well, can I, okay? Let me add something quickly here is that we had, so I think this is a third point we've, we forgot to discuss earlier is that, you know, we're talking about the reasons why the stakeholder uh, brouhaha is going on. We said the first reason was of course it makes good business, right? The second reason maybe is to prevent revolution. Huh? Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe I like this. The third one might just be the uh, not an uh, easy answer, which is that w- what do markets uh, need? Especially, they need narratives, they need stories, right, to keep to keep the train moving down the track. I feel like ES maybe ESG is just like a good story for tw- for the twenty twenties, right? I'm it's like with a, you. That's a it's great a good investing one. story, right? It's just like keeping people interested, getting the Whole Foods people in, getting some young people <laughs> in, like right, like. It's just like it's another narrative to keep the stock market chugging along. Okay. So anyway. speaking of narratives, I like Nar- that. Yes, that's a yes. that's a perfect um, that's a perfect yeah. third, and it's also a bit of a segue. The World Economic Forum, which is all over because of Davos right now, released their top ten mm-hmm. risks. We've talked about them a little bit here. Mm-hmm. The, the five of the top ten, um, the top five, in fact, were all environmental and climate change related. Right. Have we turned the corner when we all believe climate change is a fundamental risk to humanity? The answer right. is, survey yeah. says, way too soon. Guess yeah. what? Your CEOs, according to a PwC survey, mm-hmm. really don't care that much about climate change. The number one threat for 2020, according to CEOs surveyed by um, PwC, was overregulation, which right. is the opposite of climate change and environmental damage because well yeah it's going to take regulation to effectively change that can i say that this speaks perfectly to our conspiracy theory which is that 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 they're, what they're trying to do is self-regulate ahead of getting regulated and that uh, there you go there it no, is the number one threat according to ceo is over regulation which you can really drop the over what they mean is regulation right i mean <laughs> Any regulation is yeah. over-regulation. <laughs> that does seem like one of those, uh, w- you know, wording in a survey to get an answer kind of thing. Like right. anybody would say, over-regulation sounds yeah. bad. They're going to um, regulate my sixth finger? <laughs> yeah. All right. Number going. three, and finally, to close us out, and I'm even going to put on um, our, our outro music in the background okay. as I number three this. Stakeholders. Stakeholders or whatever who aren't my kids are talking about <laughs> yeah. right now. My kids do yeah. not talk about stakeholders. Sounds like one of your daughters is, but yeah. In fact, we talked about it ad nauseum today. We you know, did. You know, what's, you know what's too soon? When what? Jamie Dimon, Brian Moynihan, the Business Roundtable, and the World Economic Forum are your messenger for stakeholders as capitalism. It's too soon when the max, the minimum entry fee to just talk about stakeholders at Davos is $87,000 per attendee. Ouch. Now let's guess how many stakeholders can show up at Davos on their own dime. Would zero be the right number, maybe? I think zero would work, yeah. Thanks, Matt. So, uh, good show today. Good, that, good and long-winded. I like it. Long-winded, but fun anyway. That is, I'm, I'll, I'll edit like 90% of it out. There'll no, like come three on. Three words let, when let, I'm done. There should be one show out there that talks about this stuff. I mean, can you find another show that, that passionately talks about ESG nonsense? Come on. <laughs> I like I don't have to passionate edit it. nonsense talk. That is Damian yeah. Rallis. I am Matt Muscardi. This is Business Pants. We are Free Float Media. If you like what you heard, if, uh, if you don't like what you heard, I don't care. Tell yeah, me. Uh, subscribe anyway and rate us five yeah. stars. 
send yeah. us to your friends. Tell, talk about us. Because guess what? If you like to passionate discussion of nonsensical ESG topics that you can you only get in one place, down. we won't be able to do that unless you subscribe and rate us and tell your friends. This becomes like a real thing. So do that. Uh, but I want to thank the two Courtney's, Dan Rogachnig, Tato Vanek, and the Asset Clowns, John Walsh. Our team here is amazing. They're constantly doing amazing work. Tomorrow, I have a big Matt Makes for you. Um, uh, it's, uh, and we have a big bag of business nuggets oh, to go over. Tomorrow is right. a fun yes. show. And yes. uh, I'm going to make it depressing with the Matt Makes. So All right. tune in tomorrow. And uh, I'll talk to you then, Damien. See you, Matt.